Well, if we, uh, if you're visiting, we have been in a series called uh, the Holy Nation, and really, what this series is intended to do is, we're we're in First Peter chapter two, where Peter is writing a letter to the church that's in a very interesting season, if you will. The the climate around it is uh, very hostile. There is persecution, much more so than what we face today, and yet there is some uh, great uh, application and a bridge from historically what was going on uh, in the church that Peter is writing to and where we are today. And so we have been looking at different aspects of this text, and we're going to be in 1 Peter 2, starting in verse 9, and we're going to go all the way to verse 17. And, And really my heart for today is for us to slow down and open our Bibles and actually look at the Word of God and let the Word of God speak to us based on who we are as a church. So so often we look at texts in the Bible and we take private or personal ownership, and we should because we need to, but sometimes we omit the fact that this letter is written to the collective body, the church. And so that's the case that we find in this letter. So let me start by reading again. You guys have heard this text. Uh, 1 Peter 2, starting in verse 9. If you're hunting for it in your Bible, it's a little bit after the book of Hebrews and James. There's First and Second Peter. That's where we find ourselves. So here we go. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So what I'll do is I want to just kind of work our way through this text a little bit slower than what we've done so we can take the whole picture of this in. But the very first thing that we notice that Peter is doing right now is he's talking about identity. And I really want us to look at this from identity as God's church, um, most importantly, this morning. So he's reminding us as a church in the midst of this crazy world that they find themselves in, that God's people are being built into a spiritual house. He uses all these metaphors. He he calls us living stones, and Jesus is the chief cornerstone. And so we are the little stones, the, the spiritual people of the kingdom of God that are being built into a spiritual house where we become God's priesthood, his priests, And we declare, we give spiritual sacrifices. We declare and praise God that is pleasing to him. That's what Peter's saying in actually 1 Peter chapter 1. So, but I want to look at the fact that we are God's chosen people again for a moment because I think it's really important. See, when we're God's chosen people, we have to stop and acknowledge the fact that we've been born again. And if you're not familiar with that term, Titus was talking about it when he did the communion meditation. He talked about the fact that when we yield, when we surrender to Jesus as both Lord and Savior through faith, God extends this gift of grace to us, this gift of salvation. And he puts his spirit in us and now gives us a new mission, a new voice, a new heart to begin to walk out the things that bring glory and honor to him. But as chosen people, we're born again into a new people, plural here, church. Let's keep this in mind, church. A new people and connected to a new family. We form a family, the family of God, the spiritual household of God. And we are a kingdom of believers that have been called out to represent him in this dark hard world that we find ourselves in all around us. I don't think there's anybody in here that doesn't see that there's some things that don't add up today in our world. Amen? You guys okay? You awake? Need to do any jumping jacks or anything? 
getting kind of warm in here. Well, in chapter one, Peter reminds us of this wonderful standing that we have in Christ. And I wanna read this to you. It's kind of a mini Ephesians chapter one, but follow along with me. First Peter chapter one, starting in verse three. Listen to what Peter says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, that's for us, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, there's a whole bunch in that text, but I really wanna look at this living hope for a minute because so often in the world, we put our hope in things that are dying. Like we have elections coming up on Tuesday and we often look at our government and the leaders and we put our hope in something that's perishable. But Peter's reminding the Christians back then as he is for us today that we have a living hope that is grounded and rooted in a spiritual Lord Jesus Christ, who, who came to earth, died on our behalf, ascended to heaven, and he now sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for every one of us. We have guaranteed inheritance that is stored up for us in heaven, awaiting us. Doesn't that sound good? Because so often, man, it is like, this is where I am right now, and I've got to go vote on Tuesday, and what do I do? It's a crazy deal. There's so many crazy people that are manipulating and lying and trying to get me to do it. There's a point where you just go, enough. We, we've got to start with God's perspective, this living hope that is eternal and imperishable. Amen to that? Peter goes on to say, we're gonna go back now to 1 Peter 2 and we'll stay in there for some time, but 1 Peter 2, 9, remember he says we are a royal priesthood. What does it mean to be royal? That you are a son. When you receive Christ Jesus, you become a son or daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Do you realize that? And that in itself makes you royal. You are part of God's family, this spiritual family that God has purposed to do battle and to be the salt and light in the world that we live in today. He's a spiritual king and we are his adopted sons and daughters. And I think that's very profound, but we're not just royal, we are royal, a royal priesthood. Again, this is a plural context. We as the church are a royal priesthood. And Bill did a great job last week. He talked about the fact that a priesthood, that we represent God to man and that we also intercede to man for God. Do you guys get that? And it, like we... When we live our lives for Jesus and we are set apart and we yield to Jesus Christ and his spirit is alive and at work in us, we become billboards that point people to God, right? But not only that, we come alongside people and we intercede for them to God. We make prayer, we, 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 we minister, we meet the needs of people and hope that they have an encounter with Jesus Christ and receive him as Lord and Savior. We are a chosen people and a royal priesthood. But Peter doesn't stop there. He goes, now we're a holy nation. Now the word nation is where we get ethos. It's, it's ethnos in the Greek. And it means this tribe or this family. And when you, when you go back to the word chosen, I love this in the Greek, because Greek just blows up our English language. It's just so much more colorful. So chosen in the Greek is this word eclectos, which is where we get the word eclectic. So follow me. We are an eclectic group of people with all kinds of stories, all kinds of experiences in our past that God has chosen for us to form a nation, a tribe, a people 
that are set apart to do something very important. That's why we're here, you guys. God has a plan for each and every one of us. I wanna say something about being set apart for a minute because so often we think we're being set apart away from something. Like we truly are set apart away from the evilness of this world when we are in Christ Jesus and we are operating under the power of the Holy Spirit. We are, we are different than this world. We are set apart. But we are also set apart to something. Who's that? To God. We are set apart to God and for God for his very distinct purposes. We are set apart from the pain of this world, not the pain of this world, I should say the evilness of this world, but we are set apart to God. God did not save us so that we could feel good about ourselves and he could follow us around and meet all of our needs. Newsflash, that's just not the gospel message. But he has saved us for his very distinct purpose and we get the, 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 the benefit, we benefit greatly from all that God has done in our own very lives. But this, is, this story is God's story. It's not Jim's story. I play a part in God's story. We all play a part in God's story, amen? You guys get that? It's God-centered. Then Peter goes on and he tells us that we are God's special possession. Do you believe that? I mean, why would we be called God's special possession? I believe it's because God has always purposed for people to be set apart so they could reach other people who are lost and need the light. We see that all the way back with the Israelites and Moses in Exodus. Follow along with me for a minute. It's Exodus 19, starting in verse five. God is telling Moses now what he's to say to the Israelites. Now... If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then, cause and effect, then out of all nations, you will be my what? Treasured possession. There's that, there's that special possession again that Peter's talking about. He goes on to say, although the whole world is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you are to speak to the Israelites. So when we're in 1 Peter and we're looking at what Peter's talking about, he's not inventing something. He's basically declaring what God has already stated back in the Old Testament. Peter is now talking to the church and he's going back at a spiritual level and he's saying, you're no longer brick and mortar like the temple. You are living stones, living hope. There's this active spiritual dynamic about God's kingdom that supersedes anything else. And Peter says, guess what? We get to be a part of it. Isn't that, are you guys excited yet? Come on. Just a little bit of excitement. Come on. Hey. Paul in Ephesians 2 says, for we are God's masterpiece. Look, this is a very personal message. I hope you understand this. You are God's masterpiece. He has created you anew in Christ Jesus so that you can do things which God prepared in advance for you to do. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to your neighbor. Seriously, I gotta wake up here. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are God's masterpiece created to do good things which God prepared, prepared in advance for you to do. Say it, come on, out loud, I wanna hear it. <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever get up in the morning and feel like you're not ma God's masterpiece? You ever look in the mirror and go, I'm maybe a piece, but... I don't know. Yeah, this is the truth. This is our standing in Christ Jesus. God loves us. We are his special possession. We are his masterpiece that he's created to do good works. We as a church, that's our story. We come together as an eclectic group, but we're with a very distinct purpose. Well, Peter now goes on and talks about the purpose of the church. So in verse 9, 1 Peter 2, 9, at the very end, he says, you know, he, he talks about it, you are a chosen people, right? A royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
You're God's special possession, right? So what does he say now? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That you may declare the praises of who? Of Jesus, who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's our purpose, church. That's how we glorify God, by praising and bringing glory and honor to him, declaring the praises. We exist to make much of God, right? This is what rocks me, though. We do, like, we, we're called to represent God not only with what we say with our lips, but how we actually live it out, right? Deeds, action, and words, they've got to align. Paul says in Ephesians 4, that live your lives in a manner worthy of the calling that you've received. Peter's, Peter's saying the same thing here. And then I, I, you guys, I got to own some stuff here. Because like, I've been told before, Jim, don't say anything unless you have something good to say. Because so often, and I, I want you to follow me for a minute. So often we get saved and then there's this tidal wave of stuff that we deal with on planet Earth and then we walk around and it's like, yeah, I'm a Christian and yeah, it's okay. I've been bought by the blood of Jesus. But there's nothing in our lives that's like appealing to people who are actually lost, right? Like I, I'm a guy that looks at a glass half empty more times than I like to admit. Is anybody else in here? Like I can be chief dark cloud in a New York minute. Like, I, I really can just pour water on something good and just soak it with my very mouth and forget that I'm even a Christian. Look, hey, do you guys, stop for a minute. Do you remember when you were spiritually dead? Stop to think about that. Some of you, it may have been yesterday. Some of you, it may have been 50 years ago. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I forget where God has brought me from. Thinking about John 11 with Lazarus. Many of you know the story. Lazarus is dead. Jesus tarries to come. He's gonna, he's gonna raise Lazarus from the dead, but all the people are like, you should have come. You should have raised him from the dead, blah, 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 blah. Then there's Martha. Jesus is ready to roll away the stone. What does Martha say? Lord, it's gonna stink. That's something that I would say. Instead of recognizing that Jesus is ready to roll away the stone and raise Lazarus to a new life, I'm like, I'm focused on, it's gonna stink. Does anybody resonate with this? As a Christian, it's gonna stink after the elections on Tuesday. Is God not on the throne? But you guys, I can be a Martha so fast. It stinks. I love the story because what does Jesus say? Lazarus, come out. Then what's the next thing? He says, take the grave clothes off of him. Are you still walking around as a Christian with your grave clothes on? All wrapped up? Like, you, can, you guys, we have, we're, we're, we're supposed to declare the praises of him who brought us out of darkness into his wonderful light. How do we encourage one another to do this? When you show up, and look, we all have bad days. But this is an area in my own life, you guys, I have to work on because I'm a half-empty guy. And before I know it, I'm no model or representative of Christ Jesus. And yet he's making his very appeal through me. There's a disconnect. We have been called out of death into Christ and his church. You're not saved just for your own possession. You are God's special possession and God's plan is for us to be a royal priesthood and a holy nation so that we collectively declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness, amen? Well, Peter now throws down on us and he says there's social conduct that your life should align with if you're gonna be my royal priesthood and the holy nation that I've called you to be. There's social conduct. Starts in verse 11. 1 Peter 2, 11. Dear friends, I urge you, 
That word urge in the Greek means to come close beside and exhort. It's very relational in nature. I'm gonna come close beside you. I'm gonna put my arm around you, but I'm gonna speak some truth into your life. That's what he's saying in this letter. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now we get into verse 13. Buckle up. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. What? Every? Yeah, even the ones we don't agree with. Whether to be the whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is it is God's will that you, that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of such foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as God's slaves, show proper respect to who? To everyone, love the family of believers, fear God and honor the emperor. That's a tall order. Does that challenge anybody in here? It's that word submit, ooh, we love that word. We love it. First thing I wanna pull out of this though as we follow through. First thing, remember that your identity and your citizenship is not primarily as an Idahoan or an American. Did you hear that? Your identity, look, we have the blessing of living in Idaho and we have the blessing of living in a great country that's called America. But Peter's telling us that we're foreigners and exiles to this country. And if we don't get that right to start off with, we're gonna miss all the rest of it. Our identity is that of Christ Jesus. We are a part of a royal family and a royal kingdom, right? I, uh, I was thinking about this. Um, my first deployment, when I was in the Navy, I was over in the Middle East for, a, for six months. And I'll never forget, the first time I came back, we came in, uh, I was on a guided missile cruiser, we came back into San Diego, and the minute we got past Point Loma, I was choking back tears. And the closer we got to downtown, because San Diego is my hometown, right? I was living there in the military. The closer we got to my hometown, I could not, even trying to be a macho sailor, I could not keep the tears back. I was just bawling. I was bawling because I had been a foreigner in the Middle East that I didn't identify with. It was like I was, I wanted to come home. I was coming home to what was my home, San Diego. I don't know about you guys, but but God has something far greater. I was thinking about, we had, Corey and I did the celebration of, of Rudy Herzog's uh, celebration of life on Friday. And I was thinking about, this is what Rudy got to experience. I mean, like I got to just see San Diego and cry. Can you imagine when you come home to be with the Lord, when you go to be with the Lord? Like all of this weight and pressure, all the, the travails of life, gone. Can I get like a praise God for that? Like San Diego in the day was really good because it was nice and the weather was good. It's not heaven, nor is Idaho, nor is anywhere else on planet Earth right now. That's for sure. Second thing, we are to abstain from sinful desires of our flesh and choose the will of God. Because I can be chief dark cloud at times, I literally have to fast or stay away from politics. Now, I'm informed and I, I, I regulate my reading, but I have to be very, very careful because I can like turn in a minute in my entire disposition and my entire attitude towards the kingdom that I actually belong to dissipates and my soul is vexed. Does anybody in here ever get that place to that place? You guys are a bunch of liars. There's only like three hands in here. Maybe it isn't politics for you. It's something else. Like you, you guys get it, squirrel. You know, you're, 
You lose, you're all focused on something else. Regulate my intake of drama so that I don't steal my joy. He's saying abstain from sinful desires. Whatever those desires are that pull us away from God's vision for his kingdom in our lives. Third thing, we are exhorted to live good lives among the world. Why? Do you realize that over the course of time, I, I don't know about you guys, but do you ever realize like you have people that are watching you, that are, that are actually looking to see what you do with your life when things get hard? <clears throat> This to me was such an eye opener in my years in the ministry because I was a Christian. And there were young men that were constantly looking, gauging me up, posturing, figuring out what I was all about. They weren't nice to me at times for my faith. But here's what I know. When you do good over a period of time and you represent, when I say do good, I mean when you follow Christ with your heart, right? And he then lives in you and begins to live through you they begin to see something different. And the Holy Spirit somehow supernaturally works in you and their biases and their prejudices begin to diminish. Have you ever had a friend that used to jab you for your faith that now looks to you and maybe even as a believer? Is anybody in here? Do you, do you remember the early days? It wasn't popular, was it? But over the course of time, by doing good, you tear down the lies of the evil one and the lenses that they have, and if they have a spiritual desire or appetite, they begin to see God in and through you, and they like, you are strange. I said this in first service, and it really dates me, but you guys, any of you remember the old pinball machines that you had the little flippers on the side? And we used to get like so excited. We'd be like, ah, you're doing all this. And you would shake the machine and then there was this big light that would come on and they would say, tilt. Did, did anybody remember that? Tilt. And you had to reset the machine right in the middle of the game because you got so amped up that the machine couldn't process it. Do you ever put people on tilt in your life by how you live? Where they just go, you don't add up hold on, I gotta step away, go think about this for a little bit. That's what's happening when we live as a church, as chosen people, as a royal priesthood, where we intercede on behalf of others. We talk to God about other people. We talk to people about God. When we become his holy tribe, where we are aligned, we are an eclectic mess and yet, when we are aligned in purpose and in mission, God does amazing things in and through us. It's a total privilege to be a part of it. I hope you recognize that. It's such a privilege. Point four, we are to submit to human authority. I think Peter warms us up before he gets to that submit deal right there. He warms us up a little bit. Do you realize that governments are put into authority by God? Yes, even Washington, D.C. today. God allows it in his sovereignty. Don't ask me to figure out why all that stuff happens, but God's word is very clear that he places and removes kings at his will. Do you guys get that? Now, for another sermon for another day, there are very nuanced things. This is tricky. There are times where government is asking us to do things that go against God's law, as we saw in Acts chapter four with Peter and John, where they're saying, you can't talk about this Jesus anymore. And what, is, what does Peter say? Which is, which is crazier? This in essence is what he's saying, that I, that I worry about like you guys, and I don't worry about the, my God in heaven. No, I'm gonna talk about my God. Now, I don't know what that all looks like in each of our contexts, that requires wisdom and grace and counsel. But I can tell you, it doesn't mean that we just get a license to be loose cannons and go blast people because we don't like what they're saying. That is not the life of a Christian and the witness that Jesus wants us to witness to. You guys okay? You don't like that, do you? That submit deal? Because it, it re reveals 
whether or not the humility of Christ is actually in our lives. Peter goes on to say, live as free people. And this kind of rocked me because I want you to think about this for a minute. When you, when you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, when he redeems you, when he buys you back, he forgives you and he sets you on the rock and he puts a spirit in you, you do have a new freedom. You are no longer a slave to your sinful ways, right? You're no longer bound. It doesn't mean you don't sin anymore, but you're no longer a slave to sin. But your freedom does not mean you're not a slave. Who are you a slave to? Jesus, the Christ, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. He's your Lord and your Savior. You are a bond servant of the King of Most High. So we don't use our freedom to say, I'm no longer under the authority of anybody, and because of my freedom, I can act however I want in the name of God's truth. That is counter to what the word of God says. Do you realize that? Peter is saying, don't use your freedom to do bad things. You are still a bond servant of Jesus and we put on Christ and we represent him. That is not anything you're gonna find in the gospel that Jesus lived out. Is this making sense? He says, show proper respect to who? Everyone. Is that easy? It's impossible without the Holy Spirit. Impossible. Who's been offended this week or allowed yourself to be offended? Anyone in here? How about today? You've been offended today? It'll probably happen at some point, right? Right? Show proper respect to everyone. That's what Peter's saying. Wow. Okay. He says we're to pray for our authorities. This is Paul, actually, in 1 Timothy. I want you to, I want you to follow along. 1 Timothy 2, starting in verse 1. He says, again, there's that word, I urge you, first of all, to pray for which people? All people. Really? I got to pray for them? Yeah. Yeah. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Who does that include? Everyone, right? Oh, my. You know, I'm sure Jesus is just, you got to laugh at us sometimes because we wrestle with this. It's like, oh, I'm sure. He, verse 2, pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. I, let's remember this. Every one of us, before we became a Christian, we needed God's grace and mercy, right? Can you guys all admit to that, right? And we still need God's grace and mercy hourly, don't we, as Christians, the people that we're praying for need God's grace and mercy, right? right? You know, well, kindness leads to repentance. Paul is saying this in here. He's saying, pray for them so that they will have favor on us so that we can go about doing our mission without interference from them. He's actually saying right here, he says it right here. Pray this way for the kings and all who are in authority so that you can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by, by godliness. What he's saying again is, yeah, I don't know if you ever do this. I forget to do this. Hey, do you ever pray for the authorities that are over us so that we would have God's favor on us so we could go about doing the gospel work that he's called us to do? That's what Paul's telling Timothy here to do. And lastly, the ultimate reason for praying for others is so that they get saved, right? What does Jesus say? He wishes none, Peter says this, wishes none to be lost. That's the heart of God. And you know, when we, when we pray for people, we are an ambassador for Christ. 
if you think about that, but 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, I want to read it. But, but part of our role, you guys, as a, as a, as in our conduct as the church is to realize, yes, we are chosen, right? Chosen people. We are his royal priesthood. We intercede. We do all these things as an act of worship to please God on behalf of others, right? And then we collectively together become this holy nation, this tribe that is unified, that marches together, that encourages and supports one another while we are ambassadors of our king. Here's what Paul says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Did you hear that? You've been given the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Now listen. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. How? when we live our lives empowered by the Holy Spirit, following what God has laid out for us as his royal priest and his holy nation, people take notice and we have an opportunity to share Christ, right? In, in P- Peter writes, in 1 Peter, he says, be prepared to give an answer for everyone. He's saying, give an answer for the hope that you have in Christ Jesus to anyone who asks. He says to do it with gentleness and respect. You see, when we live our lives set apart and we follow God's plan and we allow his spirit to work in and through us, we become these ambassadors that represent our king our holy nation in the most profound way. What does an ambassador do? An ambassador represents the values, the principles, and the leadership of the nation that they come from. That's us. That's what Peter's saying. We're a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Set apart to what? To declare the praises, to give the world the hope that we've experienced in hope that as ambassadors, that we would reconcile them to the Father. That's the role of the high priest now. That's us, every one of us. It's not optional if you're a Christian. We are as chosen ambassadors. And I love Colossians. The worship team, you guys can come up. Colossians 3, Paul does this beautiful job. It's this metaphor of putting stuff on. We're in the season now where you gotta put coats on, Right? And so I want you to think about this the next time you put your coat on to go outside. Here's what he says. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, doesn't that sound familiar? You see the same thread. We're God's chosen people, holy, set apart, and dearly loved. We're his masterpiece, right? Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another, If any of you have grievances against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So the next time you put your coat on, I want you to think about the attributes of Christ that you're putting on. In so much that even on Tuesday, when you go and vote and you have your coat on, you walk in to wherever you're gonna vote with the very character of Christ wrapped around you. Does that make sense to you guys? Versus getting in line and complaining about what politician we want out of the office, right? No, we're Christians. We're image bearers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who needs your compassion and not your judgment in your life? 
How will you show kindness to the person in your life who is most difficult? How will you be gentle and patient with someone who disagrees with you? <laughs> How does that work? Remember if someone disagrees with you and you want to fight? You know what? Here's a question for you. What is the best way to treat someone who is in opposition to you? Be a friend. Instead of fighting them and arguing, be a friend. Love them so that they will see the love of Christ in and through you and the, the things that they think of you will change and they'll look to God, right? I don't know who in your life you trust to ask this question, but I would ask it. Do others see you as set apart for God? Maybe it's your spouse, a friend. Do they see you set apart? Do they see you set apart from the evil things of this world and set to, apart to God for God's purposes? That's the question. How do you declare the praises of God who has brought you out of darkness? How, how do you do that in your life? And there's some practical ways. I'm, I'm not saying be a phony and run out there and, you know, run, chase people away, but how do you declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness? We have a story, don't we, church? In what relational sphere are you being used as an ambassador? Which one? Work? Your own family? Your marriage? The crazy world we're in? Being in line at Super One? Are you an ambassador there? What kind of character are you clothing yourself with? That's the question. You know, I don't know what God is speaking to you this afternoon. Um, if, if you're doing some heart work and the Lord's laying something on your heart, just stay seated and spend time with God. Maybe you need prayer for something. Maybe there's something hits you right between the eyes. You just need to surrender. Maybe there's something going on in your life. You just need prayer so that your perspective is not chief dark cloud, but something else, right? Whatever that looks like, let's just stand and praise God. Let's declare his praises together, church. Amen.